All right. Uh, welcome, everyone. Thanks for attending uh, the second of our Farms' Intro to Organics webinar series. Um, we are happy to present this program that is supported by the United States Department of Agriculture's AMS, which is the Ag Marketing Services Transition to Organic Partnership Program. Um, last week, we talked about kind of just some backgrounds about around organic um, agriculture and sustainable agriculture. And then today, we're really going to go a little bit more into depth on that path to certification and what that would look like for the farm. And we have Nick Podal uh, joining us today as the guest speaker. And I um, will go ahead and turn it over to you, Nick. All right, thank you. Hi everyone, I'm, I'm Nick Podal. Uh, I'm an organic consultant and the Northern Plains Regional Manager with the Rodale Institute. Uh, I grew up on an organic farm there in Southeast North Dakota. And uh, I'm located over in north central Minnesota now, but get back to North Dakota pretty often. So, um, yeah, I'll talk a little bit today about the, the certification process and um, what it looks like for a farm that wants to begin transition. So I'll um, share my screen here. And um, should be able to get going. All right. Um, oops. Everyone see that okay? All right. I'll get started here. Um, so, yeah, as we said, this is a transition to organic and the path to certification. Um, I'll start just kind of with a brief uh, introduction into what organic production is as it's uh, defined by the USDA National Organic Program. Um, so they define it as a production of crops in a system that relies on ecosystem management rather than external agricultural inputs. So um, the term is organic is protected and regulated by the USDA, um, which is why uh, part of the reason why certification for it exists and certified organic operations are inspected for compliance to, to the standards of that system on an annual basis. Uh, in general, organic agriculture prohibits the use of synthetic fertilizers, herbicides, and genetically engineered seed. Um, many commercial fungicides and insecticides are also prohibited, and the NOP maintains a national list of allowed and prohibited substances. Uh, Nick, I want I'm gonna quickly. Uh, sorry. Sure. So we're we see your screen. It's it's on the first. It's on your first slide still. Oh, okay. Uh, so we are not seeing it in presentation mode. All right. Uh, let me see if I can figure that out here. Okay, if I move the slide now, does that work? Yes. Okay. Sorry, right. looks good, thank you. No, that's all right, thank you for pointing that out. Okay, so um, next slide then. Um, so then what is organic certification? So this kind of, this is a graphic that kind of gives you an idea of, of uh, sort of that pathway to certification. It kind of, uh, outlines you know who the uh, who the players are in the process so it starts with the USDA uh, the National Organic Program that maintains the standards and uh, then there are several certification agencies there are four of them listed there um, and again that's not an exhaustive list of certifiers but there are just some that are examples so the certification agencies are in charge of um, looking after uh, those standards, and they are independent of the USDA. Um, and um, again, they're in charge of lining up 
inspection and then making the certification decisions for each individual farm. And organic farmers have the uh, freedom to choose which organic certification agency they want to work with. It's often easier to work with someone that's uh, in your region um, because it's easier to get inspection done. Um, but you can work with um, essentially anybody in the in the country that you would like to. Um, the that that middle section there are the inspectors. Uh, the inspectors that go out and and actually inspect the farm for the certifier are also independent. So they are uh, hired uh, mm -hmm. by the the certification agency to actually conduct the inspections on the farm, but they are not. Uh, they're they're basically contract work. They are not uh, uh, actual employees of the certification agencies, and that's again another layer of. Uh, it adds another layer of sort of protection, um, and integrity for the farmer, uh, because those inspectors are. Um, they're not beholden to um, the the USDA or the the certification agencies, and so uh, they really have uh, no other. Uh, they really have no other motivation for their work other than maintaining the integrity of the organic standards. Um, and so again, that was purposely built in. Um, even before the USDA um, took over the organic standards, but I won't get into all that history. But again, there's there's layer the way that was designed. There's layers of uh, protection for the integrity of the standards and for the farmers. Um, so then you have the farms or the processors. Um, once the inspectors are done inspecting your farm, they generate a report that goes back to the certifier. And then the certifier looks at what the inspector found on the farm, and then they make a certification decision, which they send back to the farm. And that's what those two red arrows are indicating there. So here's really just a simplified list of the five steps that it takes to get to certification. So you complete an application uh, that you send to a certification uh, uh, body. And again, you can choose whoever you want to work with, but you just complete an application to them. Um, then you submit an organic system plan to that certifying agency for a review. Um, they'll go back and forth with you several times um, and ask you to add to certain sections uh, or clarify certain information uh, as necessary. Um, but they basically want all the information that they can about the farm. And I'll go through a lot of what's in the organic system plan yet. Um, and then, uh, so they want documentation that the, the rules are being followed basically in that organic system plan. And then they will schedule an on-site inspection, which is where the that independent inspector comes out to actually look at your farm and then verify that what's in the organic system plan is actually what's happening on the farm. Um, then that goes back to the certifying body. They evaluate that inspection report, and then they issue the certification decision, um, which is a certificate that says you are certified organic by that agency. Um, and then you are allowed to use uh, USDA organic on your um, product labels and and uh, you can and you can use the organic seal from the USDA on your products as well. So with the certifying agency, um, there is a, a, usually an, a, a fee that's associated with application and certification. So um, this is just an example from Oregon Tilth, which is one of the older certifying bodies in the country. Um, but this just gives kind of a, a quick uh, breakdown of what the fees look like. Um, and you can see it changes a little bit uh, depending on the type of farm. Um, crops are usually the most simple thing to certify. 
livestock gets a little bit more complicated. Um, if you have farm, if you have a farm with livestock and crops together, you can see they don't charge any extra for that. They just uh, keep that the same. And then processors and handlers, so like a food business, or if your farm has about has a value added uh, part of the chain of your production, um, you would obtain a separate uh, certificate for your processing. And so you would you would have your crops certified or your livestock certified or both. And then if you were processing any of those uh, crops or livestock to sell as a retail product, you would also have a processing or handling certificate as well. And so that is an extra cost on top of that because there's some extra uh, regulations that are related to processing of uh, agricultural products. So um, a lot of these fees um, uh, are able to be offset and I'll, I'll go over this earlier uh, or later, um, but there's a, um, there are programs out there that uh, through NRCS or FSA that allow you to uh, offset a pretty significant amount of your uh, uh, application and certification fees. So, um, and there's a note there on the side, the timing of when you would want to submit. Um, you would want to submit your application and get your OSP done at least four to five months of your expected harvest date of an organic crop. And I'll talk about the transition period a little bit uh, coming up here, um, but there's basically it takes three years to transition to organic. And then, um, so there's there's that 36 months of, of transition period. And then, uh, you can you can harvest so often there's two years of transitional crops and then that third crop year is when you would harvest an organic crop and so you can be working with a certifier during that whole time if you would like to um, but again four to five months is kind of like uh, the sort of like the the Closest you can cut it, I would say. Um, you want to get in and start working with the certifier. I think sooner than that, sooner the better. Um, but that's kind of a, a sort of a, a rough uh, deadline, I guess. Um, so choosing a certification agency, um, one way to go about, you know, choosing, um, you can look at uh, several different considerations like the fee structure. A lot of them are pretty similar, um, but sometimes you might find um, that you can save a little bit of money with one versus the other. Um, but um, a lot of them are quite similar, I would say. Um, areas of expertise is often pretty important. So looking at the types of farms that they typically certify and seeing if that matches with what your operation does um, is, is often kind of important. Um, Responsiveness uh, is one that, you know, anybody, anybody will often, uh, you know, sort of judge uh, um, anybody that they're working with by if, you know, if you send in an application and it's, you know, months before you hear back from them, you know, farmers are not, you know, necessarily going to want to work with agencies that are slow to respond. And so, that's often a consideration. Um, although most, I would say, are pretty good about that. Um, although I would say in recent years, there's been kind of a lag in in, in sort of processing times because I think certification agencies are busier than they've ever been. And there's a lot of uh, newer employees that are coming in to work for certification agencies. And so, uh, we have a little, I think they have a little bit of catching up to do as far as maybe how responsive they uh, used to be. Um, but again, that's, you know, uh, it's to be expected in the environment that we're in. And I think, you know, it's a good thing that they're busy, actually. So um, having a little bit of patience as a farmer, too, um, right now, I think is also required. So, um you can look at any other services that they offer. Sometimes there are other certifications that you 
may want to obtain besides organic certification. And some of these certifying bodies actually offer other types of, of certifications, whether it's maybe a, a water quality designation or something like that, that some states have. Um, there's lots of different things um, and they, they will certify to often several standards, um, including USDA organic. So that might be a consideration as well. And then kind of looking at their structure, if it's a state agency, like for instance, Minnesota is a state agency uh, or has a state agency uh, that's housed at the University of Minnesota. Um, some uh, agencies are for-profit, some of them are non-profit. So depending on, um, you know, what you would most like to support, that's some kind of a, that's some consideration there. Um, but Rodale has a organic farm search tool. And this is a, a tool that we developed with basically matches the USDA database of organic farmers uh, to a map. And you can go on uh, Rodale's website and basically put in your address and it'll show, show you um, other organic operations within certain proximity. And it's linked to that, that USDA database that lists every certified organic uh, operation that there is in the country and who their certifier is, uh, what crops or livestock or products that they uh, deal in. And um, you, can, you can see, it'll help you make a decision, I think, with your certification agency. You can see what other farm, what the other farms, uh, organic farms in your area what agency they're most commonly working with. Um, and that's often, a, you know, a pretty good indicator of who's who's very good, who you know, who's good to work with and might match up with your, uh, with your type of farm. And also getting, a, uh, getting an inspection scheduled will often be easier if you have other farms in the area that are also needing to be inspected, so. Um, here's some USDA programs that will help you uh, in transition. Some of these are newer programs. Some of them have been around for a couple of years. Uh, the certification cost share program, um, that's in its last year of, the, of its current renewal. I'm assuming that that program is going to continue, um, but in the, last, um, in the last year and a half or so, they have increased this program from a 50% uh, or $500 reimbursement up to 75% or $750. So uh, they, um, the FSA uh, has increased its, uh, its cost share for certification costs uh, as those have gone up a little bit um, like everything else does. Uh, and so um, that's $750 per certification scope. So again, you could get that towards your crops you could get that towards your livestock or you could get that towards your processing and handling certificate. Uh, you could potentially get up to that much towards all three of those. So um, uh, yeah, so that's a good program to take advantage of. Um, the deadline for applying for that for this year was November 1st. Um, and so for next year, it'll, it'll once it, that program gets renewed, um, it should be again next fall. Um, and it will cover expenses from the previous year. So that shouldn't stop you from seeking organic certification if that's a consideration for you at any time. Um, it just has an application deadline and then it's retro retroactive basically to uh, the year before the whole entire year before that. So you can incur certification costs up to that deadline in the year and you can get reimbursed for them um, on the back end. So um, transitional and organic grower assistance program or TOGA, this is uh, uh, the program that helps uh, transitioning and organic producers to receive uh, additional premium assistance on their crop insurance. And if you already have federal crop insurance, it's uh, and they know that you're an organic producer or that you're transitioning, it's automatically applied to that. So you don't really have to do anything extra to take advantage of that. Um, it's, a, it's a program that's, that's uh, offered to 
uh, again, transitioning and organic farmers, and, and it's pretty easy to take advantage of. Um, then the big one that's new here is this NRCS organic, organic management practice standard. Um, this is a new program that was piloted in Iowa. It's available in other states now uh, that starting this past spring, it was available in, in I think all the other states across the country. Um, and there's not a lot of good training through the NRCS for this program yet. So it might take, uh, in my experience with producers I've been working with, it's taken a little poking and prodding to get them uh, to get the NRCS to learn what this program is and be able to uh, get farmers signed up for it. But it's worth the effort because it provides direct payments to transitioning and certified organic producers for anywhere from two to $600 an acre, uh, depending on how they rank you. And that's um, pretty significant. Um, that can really, especially in transition, that can really offset um, a lot of the losses that um, that that farmers see during that period um, when you are still getting uh, conventional prices for your products, but you're working with organic practices and, and the extra costs that come along with that and maybe reduce yields as well. So this can really help to offset that. And I think it's about time that organic producers got, uh, you know, there's there's been a lot of programs for conservation practices um, in years past and organic producers have been doing an exceptional job of conservation for decades now. And it's about time that um, uh, we were able to take advantage of some of the conservation programs that's out there. So again, organic management is actually listed as a conservation practice standard now. And all you have to submit is basically like a two page form. And if you're already working with NRCS, uh, the equip program or any other of their uh, programs, they should have your organic systems plan that will also be required as documentation of the standard. And um, it's again, you'd already have that filled out and you just have to fill out a two page form and it's pretty easy. Um, the application deadlines for it vary by state. So um, you have to get in contact with your local NRCS office, but um, the one for this fall for North Dakota has passed, um, but there should be another one this coming spring. And I, and it should be, um, it should be in early June, I think. Um, but I think you can continue to apply to this program. It has existed now for, uh, like I said, basically it's been available for, uh, two application periods one this past spring and then one this fall. And I think it should be available again, so. Okay, so I've talked about an OSP or organic systems plan. I meant to reference that a few times here, but this is the primary document that inspectors and certifying agencies use to verify that the farm's following organic practices and the, the standards that are listed in the NOP. Uh, it's the most important and the most detailed document uh, that's that's basically in your file with the certifier. It includes all the crops and products that you have that will be certified, um, your soil and crop fertility information, um, your natural resources and biodiversity practices, um, which again are required underneath uh, the standards. Um, so your farm is, um, it's not just requirements about like, you know, what you can and can't use as inputs, although that's really important and people tend to focus on that. There also is requirements about conservation and uh, and those types of things that you're required to have some practices in place that enhance that on your farm. Um, it lists your crop rotation uh, and your past, you know, field histories. Uh, it's documentation for all of that. All of the inputs that were used on those fields um, your weed and pest management plans. Um, so this kind of details, um, you know, what what types of, of practices you're going to use to manage these things um, outside of inputs, of course. And then the equipment that you are using, what types of tillage that you're doing, and then um, your marketing plan as, as well. So again, all that is used to kind of 
verify that you're following the organic standards uh, as they're written in the NOP. Um, and the marketing stuff especially is kind of is used to sort of um, allow inspectors to be able to do like a trace back. And so organics, the organic standard is really neat because it's one of the, the only certifications out there that you can, that you can trace uh, an agricultural product back to the farm and through the OSP back to the field where it was grown. And that's really um, a unique and special thing to organic certification that exists. Um, and again, it's good for the farmer and it's good for the consumer that we do that. Um, so here's the basic requirements. I recommend, uh, I, or I reference the 36 months um, and it's 36 months from the last prohibited substance that was applied. So say you were growing conventional corn or soybeans, um, the last time you sprayed that field um, during the growing season, um, so maybe in July or something like that, um, that's going to be uh, that's going to be your your uh, date that transition started basically, um, and so it's 36 months from that. So any crop harvested after those 36 months have passed, and you're certified organic, if the crop is harvested harvested past that, then it's eligible to be sold as certified organic. So that's why I said you have those two crop years of transition, and then the third crop year is often able to be sold as organic. Um, so during the transition period, no synthetic pesticides or fertilizers are allowed to be used. Um, you need to have a crop rotation implemented um, that would meet organic standards. Um, you need to keep records um, of all of your inputs and your harvest records uh, as you would underneath organic certification. Uh, organic seed is generally required. Um, Although the, the only exception to that is if you are planting a certain variety that um, you, you for, for agronomic reasons, you have chosen a certain variety to use on your farm. And if that is not available from an organic seed source, um, you're allowed to prove that with a seed search and uh, use uh, a conventional seed. As long as that seed though, is still not treated with anything uh, that would be prohibited, or it's it's and it also can't be GMO. So those are the two caveats there. Um, but you can use non-certified seed again as long as it's as long as you've proven the the reason that you need to, and it's not treated and non-GMO. Um, and then you also have to uh, be in compliance with manure and lime and compost regulations. So um, manure can't have been treated with anything, um, you know, to control flies or something like that. Sometimes they'll actually spray manure piles. Um, so you have to make sure of that. Um, lime has to be mined. Uh, uh, lime, it can't be uh, ag lime or slick lime. Uh, that's gone through a chemical process that has to be um, naturally mined lime if you need to use that. Uh, and then the compost regulations uh, are, it's, it kind of go along with the manure, but uh, the compost regulations are that uh, manure piles, that the, uh, if you're composting manure or any other thing, you need to document uh, the practices used to compost it. So, that's in the NOP regulations. You, you have to document temperature and when piles were turned and things like that. Um, if you don't do that, basically the certifier looks at it as um, essentially in the regulation as they would raw manure. So, which can still be applied to fields, but the regulation says that um, if it's a, if it's a, a crop that the um, uh, product may come in contact with uh, with the ground that you have to uh, the manure has to be applied at least um, 120 days before harvest uh, for like a vegetable crop 
And then for like a grain crop, it has to be applied uh, 90 days before harvest. Um, and so those things you need to be aware of and, and adhere to those during the transition period too. Uh, buffer zones are something else that, that might change for your farm um, when you're transitioning to organic. Um, the regulations don't have a defined width for buffer areas. It's it's defined as a, on a case by case basis. So the inspector and the certification agency will make a uh, the inspector will make a report, and the certification agency will will make a decision about what uh, the width of any buffer areas uh, that might be required would be. Um, and it's a case by case basis because it depends on if there's trees in the way, if there are you know other physical things that may um, prevent contamination that. Um, and and to what degree? So that again, that has to be sort of made made a decision by on a case by case basis. And so, they may say that a buffer, uh, you know, only has to be thirty feet. They may say it should be a hundred feet, um, depending on the conditions that are present. Um, you know, prevailing winds kind of play into that as well, uh, into that decision. Um, but generally, uh, a it's a minimum of about 30 feet, typically, that we see from certifiers. And also generally uh, a roadway and a ditch uh, is considered uh, sufficient in most cases as well. Um, so they're not overly strict about this um, because we don't wanna be eating into production areas too much. Um, you can actually still crop those areas, the buffer areas, but um, uh, a lot of farmers don't if they're certifying the whole farm, um, just because you would have to sell the, the the crop in the buffer zone as not organic. And so if it's a conventional, half conventional, half certified operation or a mix of that, um, and they can put it in with their conventional, sometimes they will do that. Um, and it's easy to take a couple of strips with the combine up and down the side and put it in conventional and and sometimes that's um, easy enough to do, but depends on the situation. So, um, other things that might change on the farm, your weed control methods are going to change. Um, you're going to try to prevent weeds through cultural controls. Um, your crop rotation and cover cropping practices, um, and then using mechanical methods like cultivation. Uh, maybe rolling cover crops, um, potentially mowing, um, and even hand labor in, uh, you know, smaller scale, you know, vegetable systems and things like that. Uh, or potentially even in large cropping systems, uh, organic farmers still go out and, and um, you know, pull weeds and soybeans or hire crews to do that. Um, and... Uh, Again, the organic premiums that are attached to those crops make it worth it to do that. Um, and so we still employ some of those kinds of practices in organic production. Um, fertility inputs and soil amendments are going to uh, change as well. You're going to be using animal manures um, uh, for you know maybe more uh, nutrient intensive crops, green manures uh, from cover crops, uh, compost uh, materials, and then some minerals, some naturally mined mineral inputs. Um, like I said, you can use naturally mined lime. There's also uh, like rock phosphate for phosphorus. Um, there's um, uh, inputs for potassium as well. Uh, there, there's, uh, um, Let's see, there's a few other things. Sulfur, elemental sulfur you can use. Um, so some of those mineral inputs, uh, if they're naturally mined, are allowed in organic production. Um, and then pest and disease control. So you're gonna be focusing basically on prevention. Um, there are some approved products that you can apply, um, but they're usually only economical on smaller scale basis. Um, but there are, you know, products that can be used 
um, things like neem oil um, uh, or um, uh, pyrethrins that are naturally derived. So there's a product called Pyganic um, that's, that's pretty commonly used. Um, and uh, there's a few other things. But again, focusing on prevention is going to be the main thing. Um, and you're going to do that through uh, rotation and, um, you know, management of, of residues and cover crops um, to help you do those things. Um, and again, most farmers are, are, I would say, are pretty successful with that. Um, in a healthy functioning organic system, you always have kind of a certain level of, of pests. Um, and uh, especially with, with certain pests like insects and things like that, you might have a certain level of them. Um, but if you have a healthy functioning system, um, any certain pest should never get out of control. And that's kind of the, the focus on prevention and management there. Um, and then inputs. So this is kind of the, the general rule is that synthetic materials are typically prohibited unless they're very specifically allowed. There's a handful of them that are allowed and, and those are specifically listed out in the NOP. Non-synthetic materials or natural materials are typically allowed unless they are specifically prohibited. So two basically opposite statements there, but they kind of sum up what the approach is to synthetic and non-synthetic materials as inputs. Um, so there are lots of natural inputs uh, that are non-synthetic that are also not allowed. Uh, things that are, you know, very toxic. So uh, something like strychnine or, uh, you know, uh, um, let's see, what's another one? Uh, sewage sludge is, is not allowed to be used. Anything like that that could, you know, really jeopardize, you know, human health if it's allowed as an input. So um, their sewage sludge is, is, I listed that one out specifically, but that one's really important actually. Um, it's not typical that we would use that as a fertility source in the United States, um, but in other countries that are also, that also have organic production, um, that is uh, sometimes used. So that's, uh, a characteristic of USDA organic, organic production in the United States that we specifically outlaw the use of that for food safety reasons. So um, so any input has to be reviewed and approved for your specific farm by your certifier. Um, and <clears throat> there's, you can also have, there's also products that are, you know, new products that are developed are also petitioned at the request of manufacturers to be reviewed by the NOP uh, and allowed as well. And sometimes they do, they so they're constantly kind of adding to that list. Um, many inputs are approved with kind of res specific restrictions on composition or use patterns. So there are even some you know, natural materials that are allowed to be used are only allowed to be used at certain rates. So an example of that would be like Chilean nitrate, which is a naturally mined rock that's really high in nitrogen uh, and it's immediately available nitrogen. So it acts very similar to, um, you know, conventional fertilizer, um, but you're only allowed to use that as a fertility source for a certain percentage of your total fertility needs um, because there are some, it's a, it's a rock salt. So there are some negative aspects of using a lot of it in your system. And so again, organic rules are, uh, they're very comprehensive. And just because a product is natural does not necessarily mean that it's allowed to be used uh, at all or at any rate you want. So um, it's um, it's not as night and day as you as as you might think. Um, but there's a uh, an organization called OMRI that it's the Organic Materials Review Institute is what that stands for, and they basically review all of the um, inputs that are uh, listed for organic use and 
they review the actual products from manufacturers and verify that those meet the standard. And so Omri is a good uh, resource to go to if you're wondering about a certain input, whether it should be allowed. Um, if it's listed in Omri, it's probably safe. Um, but again, your, in, your certifier should know what all of your list of inputs are going to be. And you make plans for this ahead of time and it's listed in your OSP. So anytime you have a change to those plans, that are those fertility plans that are in your OSP already, you need to contact your certifier anyway. Um, and so if you're gonna use a new product or something um, that's not in your OSP, you should contact your certifier anyway um, and make sure that you can use it. So, and there, there your certifier is the final uh, decision maker on that. It can happen that you have an OMRI listed product that a certain certifier would say is going to say, um, no, you can't use that. Or they're going to say, you know, for, maybe for your type of operation, it can't be used, uh, or it can only be used at a certain rate. Um, and the certifier is is the final decision maker on that. So even if it is OMRI listed, it's generally like 99.99% .99 of the time it's good, but there is that potential that maybe it isn't. So you should always check with your certifier. Um, producer has to use uh, organically grown uh, seeds. I talked about that a little bit and, you know, you can do a seed search on that and you can use a non-organically produced untreated seed, uh, also non-GMO, if you can prove that what you want is not, the, the variety that you want is not produced organically. It's not commercially available as organic. Um, so that seed search has to be from, you have to look at at least three suppliers that you might be able to get seed from reasonably and prove that they don't have it. So it's a fairly low threshold to prove that you can't find something organically. Um, and um, Again, you know, your certifier might come back and say, you know, that 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 they'll approve that. Um, but if they if they do a, a quick seed search and you know and and do find a supplier, they'll probably tell you you need to get you need to get the seed from them. Um, and when they say commercial availability, they're talking about the form, the quality, or the quantity to fulfill an essential function in the system. So if they don't have a, the amount of seed you want to, to plant as well, that's also a, a, a consideration. Or if it doesn't meet your standards for quality, if it's not as clean as you think it should be, for instance, and you obviously don't want to be planting weed seed in your field, especially as an organic producer, you have the right to say, no, I'm I, I'm not going to plant that seed because it doesn't meet my quality expectations. Um, and that actually is a valid um, reason to reject it in terms of having a functioning organic system. Um, cost is not one of those things. So yes, organic seed can be kind of expensive, um, but if there's a certain variety that you say you want, and you're trying to get it from a non-organic source because cost is your main concern, that's not, uh, that's not a consideration as far as the standard is concerned. And so again, if they find it available organically um, with the quality and quantity and that, that would be required, you, should, you are going to be required to, to use that. So Um, record keeping, I talked about that a little bit, but you need to, basically that's to maintain and show the integrity of the product. Um, I mentioned that organic certification, you can, you can trace a product all the way back to its farm and the field that it was grown in through the, through that farm's OSP. Um, that has to be, uh, the way that we can do that is through, uh, requiring, um, a certain level of record keeping. And so that has to be maintained on the farm. So it's part of your OSP. Um, and the record keeping is a lot more complicated 
if you have a mixed operation, if part of your farm is, is conventional and, and part is certified, especially if you're using equipment between both of those. Um, so you'd have some extra record keeping there, um, but it can be simplified. So one of the things that is often the case is, uh, you know, you're combining conventional and organic crops. Well, you only have one combine maybe. So you have to, you can do that, but you have to um, verify that if you um, use the crop on conventional or you use the combine on a conventional crop, you have to verify the, the clean out procedure. So there's a certain clean out procedure that's required for a combine. And some certifiers have a certain procedure that they want you to, to follow. Um, sometimes it's, it's sort of on you to define a procedure uh, for that machine and then write it out in your OSP. Um, uh, whatever the case, you have to document whenever that was done um, by a date and time. So a lot of times the easiest way to do that as far as record keeping is just to have that procedure written out, have a copy of it, uh, and any time that clean out procedure is done, um, whoever done it, whoever did it at the farm signs and dates it. Um, and you just kind of have a running list of of dates when when those procedures were were done. So it, it, record keeping doesn't have to be super complicated, but you do have to have it does have to be done and you should have a good system to do it. Um, another thing is your equipment. Um, that might change on the farm, the equipment that's going to be needed. Um, you might need to look at pieces of equipment such as a tine weeder or a rotary hoe um, for your row crops um, using a cultivator. Um, uh, a roller crimper for cover crops might be something that you might look at. Uh, a flame weeder for uh, in corn. Um, maybe um, you have a uh, no-till planter, but um, you don't have a drill. So you might have to look at a grain drill because um, you have to maybe diversify your your um, crop rotation a little bit more. So you're going to need different pieces of equipment, um, at least some light tillage equipment. If you're like a no-till uh, conventional producer, you probably will need a little bit more tillage equipment than you did before, um, at least some light stuff and um and that type of thing but um it will change a little bit and again you may want to have depending on your situation if you have conventional and and organic production certain pieces of equipment you may want to have dedicated to organic production only um just because it would be easier to do and and may be cost effective so um cleaning and storage again that same thing sort of applies to having equipment clean out between conventional and organic same thing sort of applies to storage so you have to have uh, uh, storage that's clean uh, and you would again have to if you're using it for a conventional grain and then a certified organic one you would have to document a clean out procedure uh, in between doing that so Oftentimes it's nice to, I, I say oftentimes it's pretty nice to have uh, dedicated storage to organic because then you make sure that the integrity is there. Um, it's very easy to, to, you know, miss a clean out or, you know, put something in the wrong bin. Um, those types of things happen. And so if you're using bins that are uh, dedicated to certified organic grain, um, if you, if you make a mistake, at least it's only in another organic bin or something like that. And you haven't commingled your, uh, your crop and, and made it ineligible to, to sell as certified organic. So, um, you can, do, you can, uh, if you're very careful, again, you can do it with this, the storage that you have and, and go back and forth between conventional and organic, but, um, I kind of recommend not to do that personally, but that can be done. So uh, same thing with hay storage or any other product uh, besides grain. Grain is the most common thing, but 
um, that applies to any other product that you might have as well. So, um, again, some more in, uh, stuff on record keeping. So in the standard, it says that records have to be maintained to fully disclose all the activities and transactions of the certified operation in sufficient detail that they can be readily understood and audited by the certifier. So again, examples of these are input purchases, seed sourcing, field activity records. Um, so when tillage is done, um, when things are planted, when things are harvested, all that stuff, any spraying records, um, harvest records. So you wanna uh, keep track of when things were harvested uh, and in what amounts. Um, and that should match with your storage records. Um, Post-harvest handling, um, especially if you're uh, like washing certain, you know, if it's vegetable crops or something like that and you're doing washing, so there's post-harvest handling that there needs to be records kept of those uh, operations. And then any sales records. So this is an important part of that trace back audit that they want to be able to do. So if you say you sold a thousand bushels of organic corn, they want to be able to uh, trace that back to the bin that that was stored in. And um, you need to have a record of that. So let's, you know, is that bin, was that bin big enough to hold, you know, a thousand bushels of corn? You know, they need to be able to say that. If it's not, that kind of raises a little bit of a red flag. Well, where, you know, let's say it was only able to hold 300 bushels or your records only said there was 300 bushels in there. Where did the, you know, other bushels that you sold come from? And so those are the kinds of things that they're looking for when they, when they look back and audit. And then they also match that up to the field. How many bushels did you say that you harvested out of that field? And does that match again then with your storage and with your sales records? And that's how they are able to assure the integrity of products that are sold as certified organic. And so it's important to have those records in place. And there, I should say, there are cases of fraud where that happens. There's, if you've been paying attention in the news, every once in a while, they discover a big case of fraud. There's, um, there's been, um, there's been cases in in the fairly recent past of uh, producers that have lost their organic certification because it's been discovered that they were um, harvesting hundreds of thousands of bushels over many years of conventional corn and selling it as certified organic and um, they're able to do that because they were they caught it in their auditing of those of that farmer's records so um, that's that's why that's there um, so it's it's sometimes it's a pain for producers but if you're going to be certified organic it's also a protection of uh of of you as a as the farmer as well um the farmer that's doing all the right things um you want to make sure that uh, the integrity of the products that you're that you're selling is going to be there for for the consumer uh, because if it's not the price premiums that that you get for those products um are in in jeopardy so the consumer has to be able to trust uh, buyers have to be able to trust that that things were done the way you said they were. And so that's, again, that's not an issue with most farmers, but there are cases. And so we have to be careful with that. Um, again, uh, so there's record keeping. There are resources for this stuff. Uh, USDA has a lot of forms uh, that, that you can use to kind of write these things out. So you don't have to, necessarily write everything out as a narrative. Um, there are forms out there from USDA that you're able to use and submit to certifiers. Often certification bodies have their own forms uh, that they like you to use for record keeping. Um, and then there's also like different softwares and stuff like that that you can use um, to keep track of your records and 
um, those are those can be very helpful as well if you're um, you know if you're so inclined. Um, I, I'm a little bit of an analog farmer. I like to say I don't uh, do a lot of digital record keeping, but um, uh, more and more that's uh, that's become more popular and easier for certifiers to use even. So um, it's kind of going in that direction. Um, so then the inspection, once you uh, have uh, applied your certification agent will schedule an inspection with you. They'll tour the farm and verify that everything you have in your OSP is actually what's taking place on the farm. Typically, they're two to four hours, depending on the size of the operation, and then they occur annually after that initial certification. Um, it's not as scary as you know as people like to think it is uh, sometimes, or or not that they like to think it is, or maybe that they do think it is. Um, Certifiers want farmers to be successful in this because they have a stake in in uh, organic production as well. And so they're not looking to nitpick every little thing that you do. Um, if something is an issue, uh, as long as it's not a major like non-compliance, like you applied a chemical or something and now we have to take that field out of certification, as long as it's nothing major like that, there might be little things they find that are a little bit that are out of compliance, but you always have an opportunity to fix those types of things. They'll say, okay, this was out of compliance, but you know, it's not a major thing. So we just need you to change that and then document that in your record keeping going forward. And it's, and essentially it's as, uh, it's as simple as that. There's a little bit of paperwork that goes along with it, but um, again, they want you to be successful as an organic producer. They're not looking to, um, you know, police you to death. So, and then finally, then you have your evaluation and decision and you're is issued an organic certificate similar to how the one on the right there looks um, that the completed you know, inspection report is reviewed by this, the staff at the certification agency. Um, again, they, like I mentioned, they may have some conditions, minor non-compliances or whatever that they might need you to fix before they issue the certificate. Um, and then once you may go back and forth over that a little bit, um, just to fix little things here and there. So they make sure everything is in place and then they will notify you that you've been approved and issue your uh, certificate. If you're denied, um, you might be required to reapply, um, but it's not very often that they deny anybody because again, they want people to be successful. And so they give people opportunities to fix, you know, anything that's out of place in, in the application or the OSP uh, or that was found in the inspection. So um, it would just be, they might issue a denial if, they just don't get a response from the farmer to those things if they refuse to fix them, for instance, or something like that. So that doesn't happen very often. Um, and then lastly, you know, if you need some help with transition, um, there's help available. There's a program out there through the USDA. It's the top program. It's, it's part of what funded the webinar here today. Um, but it also funds technical assistance. And that's what I do for the Rodale Institute and my colleagues do. Um, so um, we're available in, in most of the different regions that were defined through this program across the country uh, for technical assistance for farmers to answer the types of questions you see here as you get into transition. And, um, you know, we're trained agronomists. Uh, most of us are um, our certified crop advisors and specialize in organic systems. And so we're available to help um, essentially at, at no cost. So if you need help through transition, there's people available to help. Um, these are some of the things that we do through our consulting service. It's essentially all the things that were, that are required through the NOP um, to have in your OSP we're there. We actually help write OSPs many times um, for producers. Um, so there's a lot of help available for you. 
Um, and it's as simple as, you know, if you, if you need some help from me or any of the um, other organic consultants on our team, it's as simple as, you know, giving us a call or sending us an email um, and we'll help as much as we can remotely, but we'll also come out to the farm uh, to help as well. So, and we're there kind of through the whole transition as you get certification where we're there to stay in touch with you and help. So, um, and I'm just about, I'm just right at the end here. So that's, that's it. There's my contact information. Um, again, if you have any questions about transitioning to organic, don't hesitate to reach out to me. So thanks. Thank you, Nick. That, um, that was a great kind of overview of the process of gaining organic certification. I do want to add that for next week's webinar, we are going to be joined by a panel of certified organic farmers. So if you had questions uh, that came up during today's session, I encourage you to um, write them down. Like Nick said, if you have specific questions for him, feel free to reach out. Um, or if you have questions that would be a good fit for our farmers next week, I encourage you to bring those questions to that session because we'll have a little more time uh, for discussion. Our final session is going to be the following week after that, and we will be talking more about some of the resources uh, that Nick mentioned that are available today to help you um, if you are pursuing organic certification. So it's kind of a preview for the next couple of weeks. But Nick, thank you again for joining us and thank you everyone for spending your lunch hour with us. And I'll see you here again next week. Thanks for having me. Thank you.